I'm glad you guys are working it out. This is fantastic. All right. So we have three sets of things to go through today. We have that huge packet of papers I just gave you. And then we have a few questions that Lori wanted me to ask you, and we have your proposal presentation. So it's going to be a jam-packed class, unfortunately, despite my best planning attempts. All right, so we need to do finish that top sheet. Okay, so let's look at some popular sources of information, such as People Magazine. How do we know, how reliable is People for information? How accurate is it going to be? Don't be cheating by looking at your other packet. <laughs> I thought people was fairly accurate. People? <laughs> Sometimes. So if you were writing a research paper, would you use people? No. no. Why not? That's not like, that's more like gossip. And it's not critiqued by other people. And you go home and process it and you need to make something a scholarly article. Awesome. I'm so glad that this is, you know, like a 600 copy. <laughs> How about things from Wikipedia? Wikipedia.org. You should have said that before. Thanks, baby. Be so cute. So, what if I wanted to look up today's feature article um, about this person? Or what if I wanted to look up stuff about autism? Is this a good thing to use when I am writing my. No. It's a good place to start. Okay, why is it a good place to start? Because it just gives you like a really nice, yeah, a lot of information about that one topic. And it's, would you say it's better or worse than people? Better. better. <laughs> and so it seems more believable. You can find all the information you need. Sometimes there's sources. There's a lot for this one. Chose a good topic. Um, but people can post anything about a particular topic and it can be incorrect. I was listening to something on the radio once about some guy who knew that it was wrong, but everybody else. So there's like a particular factoid that is wrong on Wikipedia. And one person knows that it's wrong, but the majority of the population is like, oh no, it's totally real. So anytime he changes it, it gets changed back because everybody else is like, no, he's wrong. So there's false information on Wikipedia. About some more. I don't know. There's I didn't a, pay enough attention. There was an article this morning. Did you know he had a pink locker room? Yeah. So <laughs> there was an editorial from somebody, I think in communications, that um, in Wikipedia it states that, that Hayden Fry was interested in psychology of colors, and the only reason he picked it is because pink is supposed to be soothing. There has been some research that has shown that and dealt with prison populations. But in Hayden Fry's own memoir, he states that pink is the color of little girls' bedrooms, and so he picked pink, and because some people think it's girly, you know, kind of a sissy color. But in Wikipedia, it states the psychology one, which was really an afterthought, so, yeah. There you go. That's a better example. All right, so now you have this beautiful organizer that looks something like this in front of you. That's it. There you go. Awesome. So you're familiar, well, oh, for literature reviews, I have asked you to use scholarly research articles. Exactly what is scholarly research? So you can see that magazines or popular literature is that tannish color. Then there's this scholarly literature, which is greenish. So you're familiar with popular resources from Google or other sites such as magazines. Scholarly articles are very specific have very specific characteristics that are similar to popular sources, yet very different. So, I would like for you
for you to take a moment with your group. I will give you three minutes to fill out that white column to the best of your ability. And if you would like to, you can look at the one of the handouts that's in your hand, but I don't have an example of up here right now. The one that has circles on it. It might be helpful. Like a screenshot of there you go. So it looks, has these things on it. <coughs> also work with your groups. said they're more accurate facts and content in scholarly journals rather than general revised information. Awesome. What'd you say? Kind of the same thing. Uh, popular literature is kind of opinion and it's more facts than scholarly articles. You guys got it. Um, the other thing that my answer key has is that it's easy to see if it's relevant to your because of the abstract. How about in an author? Authors more credentials. So we know that in the scholarly articles, can be well written and all the information is accurate. 
Awesome. Do you know anybody if you know anything? Yeah. <laughs> you ever hear the talk show with Dr. Laura? No. I don't think that's that. that she was, like, she's still around, but she was hugely popular giving like, psychological advice. Oh, oh I hear about show. that. Oh. She's like a um, podiatrist or yeah. something. I mean, she's, a, do she's a doctor, but yeah. it's like different. <laughs> Wait, is she the one that was, like, said some awful comment in the video? Oh, she's made numerous awful comments. And okay. Yeah. Maybe that's why she's not quite around. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just ridiculous. All right, who's the audience for research? People who want to like find out information. So like, more scholars than general public. Yeah, we said like information versus entertainment. Awesome language. So language is simplified in magazines, which is definitely an advantage. But at the same time, well, what we were just talking about—they don't know the level of right. scholar. Like, so there'll be discipline-specific language yeah. and research. Layout of the article. You have the answer. Yeah. Kind of trivia. Yeah. <laughs> um, like There's examples, and you shouldn't have anything in that box. If you came up with anything, I would be impressed. <laughs> what did you put in your examples box? Um, you can see Emily's box. Put people and Cosmo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then professional review. So research has been, that you get like in an article like this, has been peer reviewed. So you know it's more likely to be trustworthy and accurate. So nice job on those charts. Sorry we're going super fast. Um, so now you know what a scholarly journal looks like from the previous library lesson. How, oh, and from the previous library lesson, how to use the UI databases to find the list of journal entries on a topic. That's what we did with Dottie. So before we discuss evaluating our articles, let's do a quick review of what a search entry reveals about an article before you get the text of the article. So here you're going to be looking at I guess I should also say, here is what an article looks like. That is on, I don't know, it's on some page that I handed you. The one that has two pages side by side. Yes. I think so that so link at the bottom is to this page. And so, as you can see here, it has the title, the abstract, the intro, article text, graphic references, so every part is labeled. And then it'll tell you what it is if you click on it. Yeah, it'll be really yeah, it's helpful nice. when you're organizing. Yeah. Yeah. Please note that when you write your thesis, your abstract will not look like this because there's specific thesis abstract guidelines. But other than that, it can look like this. So um, now if you pull up this handout again, this is what you get when you search for an article. And the things in the red circles are what you can easily find about any article that it has. So it'll tell you the title, the authors, the source. So if it says People Magazine next to source, which I don't know if I've ever run into that, <laughs> you know it's not necessarily good. Um, the abstract and the affiliation of the author. So it's a good way to see if it's, the skimming the abstract will say, yes, this is actually about what I'm doing. No, it's not than knowing if it's really important, especially in the top where it says times cited in, or cited references, it tells you how much research they have looked at in writing their article. And in general, the more citations, the better. All right, ready to keep flying through this? So the last step in this process is to evaluate the list of entries your database search produces to decide which might be most useful to you in your research. So there is an evaluation criteria sheet that I handed you that has, it looks like this. Did I not hand you any? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, you got it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So this is the crap test. Mm -hmm. The crap test. <laughs> 
accuracy, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And so if it doesn't meet all those, then it's crap. But I didn't come up with it, therefore you don't get to be mad at me. So it's a list of questions to help you evaluate whether it's going to be a good article or not. To practice applying the crap criteria, we will look at the typical, typical research problem as practice. So that's another handout that you have in your hand. Sorry, there's a billion sheets today. Oh, I don't know if you came up with that one. Um, it's the one that looks, has the big empty boxes on it. I actually don't have a copy because I only have the empty sheet. Yeah, can you hold that up? It looks like that. So what I would like for you to do in five minutes is to quickly evaluate using the crap evaluation sheet those three things that you have three scenarios. The sample entries one, two, and three. And again, feel free to work in groups. <laughs> Do you have any information about the, the author? Yeah. 
Would sample entry one be a good thing to look at or not? I think it's good. Anybody else have an opinion? Yeah, we say it's good except for the dates, maybe. Yeah. Like they might have a newer research on it. Well, where did you find it? By the way, if you were yeah, asking a question like this in your class, how could you liven it up a little bit besides just asking? in a way that takes more time that we're not going to do a chance to right. in 10 minutes and I need your post feedback. <laughs> <laughs> you could, I don't know if you've ever done this in a class, but you could have your students, um, you could say, like when you said yes, you could say, okay, so you guys, if you agree, you guys go stand over there. If you disagree, you go stand over here. So I mean, you can actually let your students write things down. I believe that in college, maybe that would be easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, high school, they've got their stage either too. All right, so tell me a little bit about why it's a good article. I expect one thing from each of you. Preferably not the same thing over and over. We're going to start with Kenneth. Um, it has copyright and the author's affiliation for copyright. All right. Awesome. Um, <laughs> it was from like a, an article. Uh, I mean, it looks pretty like a valid article. In a medical journal. Well, I don't know if this means anything, but after like the one and three, it says the abstract from author. Does that mean anything? Because then the second one, it doesn't say that with the abstract. That means that the author wrote it and it wasn't made by the journal itself. Journal itself. Oh, okay. But yes, that is, Okay. that won't always be there, but that is a good indicator. Okay. I don't think I remember. Yeah, tell me, Rachel. Um, the purpose of the information is relevant. So it kind of causes the author to Yep. Yeah, and it seems like accurate information. Awesome. So I'll give you what it says on, on my sheet. Title uses specialized vocabulary to field. Uh, the author's affiliations. Um, seven pages, so it was a good length with charts and graphs. In a medical journal, and the abstract in indicates the article deals with published studies that... I don't know what MMR stands for. Oh, he's a lump sooner Bella. I was thinking mixed methods research on it. That doesn't make sense. Not responsible for large rise, okay? Number two. Good or not good? If it's good, give it a thumbs up. If it's bad, give it a thumbs down. Yay! I'm so excited. Um, some of the reasons it's not good could include... I have a question. Yes. We were having a conversation about, like, like how current the article is. What is 
Yeah. Like what that now is, is excellent question. Is it ten to five to ten years, or is it five years? I always tell so you. we usually go by the ten year rule, ten years. unless it's a seminal piece or you're so unless it's like the really important. Right, because with something like autism, like piece. this would be outdated. A two thousand and three article would be definitely outdated. Yeah, well, it could be. Could be, could be right. just because of like the more research on it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent question. But like say you're, so I do homeschooling research, I'm going to use an article that's older because it's the one that yeah. links to my topic most and there hasn't been a lot that happened in between yeah. whenever it happened and now. And I was just saying this residential program I have in the summer, the teachers will sometimes say, well, this article you had us read about girls and gifted education, this is really dated. And I'll say, okay, if you can find something that contradicts yeah. it, yeah. that's newer, but, then I'll buy everybody whatever candy you like. That's a sad thing, as I said, in some fields, things haven't really changed. Yeah. So there's no authors listed. It's only a page. It's an editorial, which means it's more opinion than fact. Um, they use the abstract has judgmental words, um, like, and it could be the loud minority. Um, opinion officials should speak out loudly in support of vaccination. So there's opinion somewhere in there. And but when would this actually be a great article to use? What could you be researching?
I only have one card. What class so is this for? It's for PE and health. Oh, okay. Rest. Yeah. And oh, it's not, I, it won't be bad. Yeah. Is that Carol Carver? Yes. on giving. Um, summarize what you're going to do for your honors thesis. What you're thinking about. Or what you're thinking about doing. We'll start with Emily. Okay. Um, so my idea is to do my thesis on how um, like a wide variety of teachers build communities in their classrooms. And so the different like methods and strategies they're using. And I didn't know if I wanted to look at it based on like regions of the country or like populations or I wasn't quite sure about that. But I really liked um, the format that Kylie did with the PowerPoint on um, bullying. Because I liked the way she set it up with the blog. And I thought that was a good way to um, have like something that I would need to write weekly to like keep on top of the writing and um, I think it would be a good format because I basically want to do this um, thesis to like help me when I become a future teacher and know like depending on the school district that I'm in and the students that I have how I could build that community of learners. That's great. And that's something you could also think about is actually finding teacher blogs about creating oh, yeah. I looked online and there are yeah a lot of resources. And so that could actually that would actually be a form of primary research that you could research the blogs. Okay. You do even and that's something the software that we have called in vivo, you could do a content analysis of teacher blogs about building community, find out what themes emerge, you know, look at the literature and see if there's actually anything that the literature says. Then you could <coughs> either write it up or blog about it yourself. Okay, cool. So, all right, Rachel, what are you doing? Okay, so you guys have heard of this many times, but my research is with adult immigrant parents and basically their acquisition process and what motivates them to learn English um, as their second language. So basically, um, just looking at the teaching and learning practices, what motivates them, how it impacts their students um, or their child's academic success, and um, why they really feel the need to acquire English at the state that they're in, because many of them are 25 plus years of age and have only had maybe a year or two of English um, language. So, yeah, that's basically it. Cool. Right. Woo. I'm sure the people who are watching this are loving this. All right. <laughs> okay, so I am going to be focusing on like the best methods to engage your students in a social studies area. Um, I think that social studies is one of those areas that a lot of kids find very boring and they don't get anything out of. And so um, I have a mentor that's, she's actually like has a grant to kind of like oh. do that kind of a thing. So I'm going to be working with her and what she does. Who's your mentor? Um, Kim Hecker. 
Cool. So, We've never worked with her before. Kim Hacker. She teaches third grade in uh, at Prairie Ridge, but she teaches the methods of social studies here awesome. as well. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Kenneth. Um, I want to do a text uh, with my nephew reading in the summer, and uh, like the focus of it is on inquiry and uh, like the applying the higher levels of Bloom's tax taxonomy instead of uh, like reading for pleasure or just reading to, for entertainment or anything like that. So uh, I want to use inquiry, inquiry and questions to uh, like delve into how he's uh, understanding what we read and things like that. And then uh, my mentor is Renita Schmidt and she teaches lit here. Um, and I think my next steps are kind of like focusing in on how I'm going to do that and uh, text it and what books I'm going to use and things like that. Awesome. How old is he? Uh, seven. That's so cool. Yeah. All right. So I feel like I'm probably really close to the camera. So in terms of what we're doing next, Leah, can you see if you can see me mm -hmm. in the camera? Okay, awesome. <laughs> so um, in terms of what we're going to do next, so either if you did a I need your proposals if you brought them in paper today. If not, you can put them in the Dropbox online, and there's going to be a discussion online where you can share them with your peers. I will also post the course evaluation online. It'll be anonymous. So please, please, please fill it out because we're thinking about revamping this class, and that is very helpful. So I know what is useful and what is not useful, especially <coughs> what's not useful so that I can not rebook the same speakers if it doesn't help. All right, um, Lori had a few questions, and we have four minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to cram them in here, and I might, you might see them reappear on the evaluation. Um, so does anybody, so we're thinking about switching this to a two-credit hour class for the next spring. And so you come in for one hour, and then your other hour would be doing some type of project, like interviewing people who do research that you might be interested in or stuff like that. And do you we think this cool database. And we build a cool database. Things. Okay, so who, uh, is that something, something that would be a good idea or not a good idea? Yeah, I think that would be very and helpful. Can, it, would, it, would making it two hours be a problem for you, like if, for the students? Because I know some of you had to get a, increased hours so you could enroll for this one credit. Would it be a problem or not? I don't think so. Okay, awesome. We were thinking about switching to grades for next doing graded. Any feedback? Yes, no? Just because you're doing all this stuff, but you're not actually doing it. Yeah, it'd be nice to get a grade for it. Um, that's another <laughs> really bad uh, And I thought, So students okay. who want to take it are going to take it. So. Oh, that's true. And I thought what we could do, though, in terms of a grade is like the first or second class session, the people who are enrolled could decide like, you've probably heard about contract grading, but you may have never done contract grading, so we could mm -hmm. set it up that way. Or we could look at some other ways of doing the grading you guys could pick. And, I mean, so you'd, it'd be all set up, but it'd give you a way to play with some grading possibilities that you might have heard of and never gotten to try. And lastly, we have an advisory board, and if the advisory board starts meeting more regularly and it has Lori and... Well, Nancy. probably Susan Esselin, our and director, and Susan Nancy Languth. Languth. And some other adults on it, like that old adults. Like people. <laughs> <laughs> um, would it be good, or would I maybe be interested in being a student liaison to that board? I mean, don't you think you should have a student That'd liaison? That'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. I just, I think so far, they meet like once a year, so. Well, last year, we didn't even manage that, so it's not <laughs> a big duty, lots of responsibility. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Make sure you do. I'll send it. I'll put up a to-do list. Make sure you check it.